Uh, I've got um, the, the, the fortunate opportunity to introduce our very esteemed presenters and they will be taking over the question and answer session this afternoon. So um, please, we ask that you do hang around, ask lots of questions um, in the second half of this presentation. But to kick it off, uh, we have Peter Kilby uh, presenting. So Peter is a senior grid transformation engineer at Energy Queensland who focuses on distribution voltage management practices and the integration of high penetrations of DER. Um, his career achievements include leading the revision to medium voltage regulation practices in southeast Queensland uh, with a view to cost effectively increasing distributed PV hosting capacities. Uh, he also co-developed the 2030 volt transition implementation strategy for Queensland, which has uh, contributed to significant uh, reductions in uh, over voltage occurrences in the state and the increased ability to um, host solar PV. He is also a member of the Australian Standard Subcommittee EL42-3 uh, and through his work in that group he's contributed to revisions of Australian Standard and New Zealand Standard 4777.2 uh, which for those who may not be familiar from the international audience is the standard uh, relating to requirements for grid connected inverters in Australia and New Zealand. Um, through his work in that standard revision, he was the co-chair of the testing work group uh, where he provided technical analysis and drafting uh, clauses for committee consideration. So very, very um, well, well read and um, knowledgeable presenter. Peter, I will um, hand over the uh, presenter function to you and really looking forward to hearing more about your presentation, mate. Thank you very much, Matthew, and, and thank you to Sigre and GN for the opportunity to present um, on this with this esteemed international panel. I'm very excited to do so today. All right. uh, I trust you're hearing me. Can you see my screen? Yep, hearing. It's the audio quality is good, and um, yeah, the the screen is is coming through well. So I'll just drop off and go into mute now, um, and and the floor is yours. Thank you. So uh, today I'd like to present on the integration of distributed solar PV in Queensland, Australia, and share some key insights on PV integration we've learned in the distribution system. Um, I'm from Energy Queensland, who's responsible for the two major distribution networks across Queensland, Ergon Energy, which supplies electricity from the northern tip, the Torres Strait Island, down to the southern southwest and also Energex, who are responsible for the high population area in southeast Queensland, which includes Brisbane and Gold Coast, our producer. Um, we employ uh, over 7,000 people, supply more than 2 million connections. Um, and today we're gonna to be focusing on the very high numbers of solar PV we've connected in, in our state. Um, that's resulted in uh, significant penetrations in many of our zone substations. So we're seeing an, an, a number, a growing number of areas with more than 50% of connections uh, hosting some level of solar PV. And um, those penetrations are rising even higher, particularly in the Southeast where um, there's, I guess, um, higher population densities. Uh, and we're seeing a number of substations now with more than 60% of connections with PV. Uh, the result of this is that we're increasingly seeing reverse flows. This is one particular substation supplied from the transmission operator, Powerlink, in Queensland. And you can see over the last decade, those flows have not only um, reduced during the middle of the day, but have now re reversed significantly as um, the PV and the distribution network flows back into the transmission network. And this has led to both voltage and capacity constraints on the distribution network. So there's three key steps I wanted to discuss today. These are far from the only steps, but they've been important in um, a number of networks in Australia. Uh, the simplest one perhaps, uh, the one that we started back in the early 2010s was adjusting our MV regulation to accommodate reverse flow and associated voltage rise, and it's certainly been helpful. Another important one that's been emerging since about 2015 has been the introduction of grid support functions on smart inverters a local autonomous voltage management across the LV network and flowing up into the MV network. And a third that I'd like to share with you today is, is still early in the development since probably 2020, but that's the use of what we call dynamic operating envelopes, which are dynamic export and import limits for distributed PV. In terms of distribution voltage management, we've recently undergone a transition. We've traditionally had a 240 volt system, similar to the UK, 
and we've been transitioning across to the 2C volt system, which is aligned with now the IEC European standards. And that's seen limited reductions in the upper limits, but significant reductions in the lower limits on voltage. And so that's allowed us to lower voltages while uh, to accommodate voltage rise during reverse flows, and that's been valuable for increasing voltage capacity. So there's some key steps that we've undertaken to support that, and that's been targeted distribution transformer type reduction. So they're the transformers on the street level, um, which, which supply low voltage to uh, customers, and where there's high PV penetrations and modest peak demand voltage drop, we've been able to lower taps. At the MV level, we've done widespread reductions and that supported the transition to the 230 volt standard. And it's also increased the headroom for the reverse flows from PV. Um, this is however being constrained on many of our onload tap changes at our zone substations, which transform voltages down to 11 or 22,000 volts due to the limited buck tap range. Most of our onload tap changes are traditionally being procured uh, for, for peak demand requirements. And so they sometimes have limited buck tap range for reverse flows. Uh, we've also implemented increasing amounts of line drop compensation, and that's been used not to boost voltages further during peak demand, but to pull the voltage down during those reverse flows. To once again, increase the headroom for reverse flows um, and also reduce the voltage spread at the ends of distribution feeders. A third thing that I'll touch on that hasn't been introduced in Queensland yet, but has been emerging in other states in Australia is the use of closed loop voltage control. So that uses monitoring or smart meter data at the ends of the distribution network to further dynamically adjust the voltages on the distribution network and uh, improve the, the performance of the network during large reverse flows or peak demand events. The second thing I wanted to touch on today is uh, the grid support functions that smart inverters are now providing in not just Australia, but also in some European jurisdictions and in, in some parts of the US, such as California and Hawaii. Um, power electronics, such as inverters, um, can not only um, draw or inject active power, which is shown here on the x-axis, but can also absorb and inject reactive power by adjusting the power factor um, and, and the, the, the phase angle between the voltage and current. Um, and this is the capability that's required of PV inverters connecting in Australia since 2021. And so it requires substantial Via absorption and injection capabilities uh, during generation. What this allows us to set is volt bar curves. So these volt bar curves require an increasing amount of VAR absorption above 1.04 per unit and also VAR injection during low voltages. This effectively allows the inverter to not only generate active power but also act like an inductor at high voltages to create um, inductive load on the network and offset some of the voltage rise caused by active power injection and has been very helpful for mitigating the voltage rise caused by distributed PV. In addition, where voltages are observed locally to rise above the limit of 253 volts, the volt watt response requires inverters to limit their maximum active power output um, to prevent further over voltage being caused. And so that ramps down the active power limit from 100% down to 20% at about 260 volts. This can be seen in the changing reactive power demand levels on our distribution network. Here once again is that bulk supply point, which um, we received um, power from the transmission network on. And you can see during the middle of the day in blue, the reverse flows that occur quite frequently. Uh, particularly in the spring when the loads are modest. In addition on this plot, I plotted the, the reactive power in orange, and you can see that often peaks in the middle of the day, and that's a result of the PV inverters now in aggregate gener injecting substantial amounts of inductive reactive demand onto the network, absorbing inductive reactive demand to offset some of the voltage rise associated with those reverse flows. Another thing to note that's been observed increasingly in distribution networks internationally is the increasing capacity of um, flows on the network. And you can see that happening consistently overnight where the, the VARs are negative as a result of that capacitance on the network. And this is thought to be a result of the increasing power electronic devices and improving power factor of many loads on our networks. <clears throat> the final um, development I wanted to share with you today relates to what has been termed dynamic operating envelopes in Australia. Dynamic operating envelopes or DOEs 
specify a varying operating range at the connection point for exports and imports through the connection point. They can apply to a range of distributed energy resources such as solar PV, batteries and electric vehicles. And it can be used in conjunction with the autonomous grid support functions I mentioned previously to ensure network and system constraints are not breached by DER operation. Dynamic operating envelopes differ from demand response in that they do not dispatch or target a response, but specify the limits of active power import or export. Within the limits, DER behaviour is unaffected. While dynamic operating envelopes are initially limited by existing visibility and systems, as the capabilities and scale up and grid visibility increases, our dynamic operating envelopes will be enhanced um, and, and continue to improve. In Australia, we use the standard IEEE 2030.5 or Smart Energy Profile, um, and we have specified CCBOS as an Australian version um, to specify these dynamic operating envelope requirements. Here's a brief example. Here you can see a traditional load profile of any sort of residential network with a peak in the evening, a lull in the middle of the day when many people are at work and a, a, a modest peak in the morning when people are getting ready to um, start their days. Over the last decade, we've seen a growing amount of PV uh, installed on these networks. We've seen the, the net load through our network reverse as a result of the PV generation in yellow. If we allow ongoing installations of PV, we eventually can breach the limits, uh, for example, at minus 100%. Of the network. And so to, to manage this and minimize this occurring, we implement a dynamic operating envelope shown, shaded in blue here. During most of the day, there is plenty of capacity for the new PV systems to inject into the distribution network. But during the middle of the day, when there's excessive reverse flows, that um, the dynamic operating envelope limits the reverse flow so that the system constra capacity constraints are not breached. Dynamic operating envelopes can also be used to limit the flexible loads on the system, such as electric vehicles that charge. And so when the network is particularly heavily loaded, this can reduce the charging from any EVs, for example. In summary, increasing distributed PV integration um, has been supported by emerging distribution capabilities in our network. In just over a decade, solar PV capacity in Queensland has increased 1,000 fold primarily on the distribution network. The 230 volt standard and improved distribution voltage regulation accommodates more voltage drives and PV. Advanced autonomous inverter grid support functions mitigate impacts and maximize PV penetration. And dynamic operating envelopes will enable active DER management and DER service participation to maximize hosting capacity. Thank you very much. There's a few references um, which you can refer to later for more information. Thanks very much, Peter. Really interesting presentation and I guess covering the journey from some uh, quite fundamental uh, changes in grid operation to, to more advanced and um, yeah, potentially intelligent or, or smart um, solutions around how we're dealing with um, high penetrations of PV. So, um, as I've said, please do throw any questions you have um, for any of these presentations in the question bar. But with that, we might uh, jump forward to our next presenter, the first uh, representative of the China contingent, Dr. Henry Ma. Henry, are you uh, good to go? Yeah, I'm okay. So, all right. I'll uh, just by way of very very quick introduction. So, Dr. Henry Ma received his PhD. PhD degree in power system and automation from the School of Electrical Engineering, Wuhan University uh, in China in 2018. He's currently a member of the New Energy PV Industry Research Center at Kuihang University and School of Electrical and Automation at Wuhan University. Uh, his research interests include integrated energy systems and energy storage systems. So all very, very relevant to this future of distribution networks. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Henry, I'll just give you the presenter rights and make sure you're all good to go. Okay, so I... now I will show my screen so we could wait a moment. Okay, so you can, you can see me. Uh, yeah, and the audio okay. screen so the audio is yours. 
Okay, so uh, it's a great honor to participate in the future distribution uh, distribution uh, networks online webinar organized by Segway. So my topic today is the concept and the perspectives of future distribution systems. So maybe it's a little delay. Okay, so. Today, I will introduce the construction objectives, key technologies, and the problems we have faced to solve the future distributions. So first, uh, about the future distribution networks, we consider that as a regional power system that integrating large-scale distribution engine, new load and energy storage, and integrating advanced sensing, information, and communication technologies. It has three features as follow. Uh, future distribution networks, including multiple forms of energy and the distribution network, should be collaboration platform, trading platform, distribution energy access, and the conception platform of those energies. It's also good speed scalability and can interact with each other flexible. Future distribution networks should be measurable. It should be able to keep track of its operation status at any times and highly controllable. It also should be capable of self-healing and satisfy the need of user for safe, reliable, and uh, communicate, uh, com economical power conception. Next, I will present some a few sets of data to give an idea of the status of distribution networks in China and its future development. Uh, China is started to build the uh, PV capacity of 18 million kilowatts in 2020. Annual average household outage time in the urban areas is almost 2.6 hours, and in the rural area is 30.6 hours. And the total social electricity consumption is 7.5 trillion trillion kilowatts. However, in 2060, China's installed P distribution PV capacity is expected to potentially reach 1 billion kilowatts, while the annual average household outage time in the urban area will be reduced to 5 minutes, and in the rural area will be reduced to 5 hours. And the, and the total social electricity consumption is 16 trillion. Especially worth noting that there is also be a leap forward in the P in the EV ownership. As a result, the development of the source networks outside of the power system will lead to a great shift in the shape of future distribution networks. Therefore, combining the three features. Uh, features of future distribution networks I presented early, we can obtain the technology features of future distribution networks. The first one, securely and reliable. This means that well, we will need a strong network construction, flexible interconnections also can be achieved between the distribution networks. Second, eco-friendly and efficient. Our future distribution networks will have a large number of distributed power stores and a high level of the electrical energy replacement in the energy system. In the area of site management for the future distribution networks, we will also uh, emphasize energy efficiency, reduce its operating and the construction cost while increasing its business value. The third one is flexible and interactive. The emergency of the large number of new lords represented by electric vehicles require a deep integration of digital technologies with each end management technologies. With a flexible and efficient electricity market, we can realize the possibility of the commercializing the flexible operating operation of the future distribution networks. So in order to achieve these above objectives, we believe it is necessary to carry out key technology research in the following area. So here's the table. Here's the table of the role of the various technologies in the building building future distribution networks. 
but it's uh, just a table, so we can see a lot of things in this table. And uh, from this picture, this picture may be more much more um, we can know much more things from this. We can see that some of the technologies we mentioned earlier have been applied in the future diffusion networks and have achieved good results. For example, uh, flexible results such as energy storage and uh, demand response, EV, DER, distribution to power and the micro grid technologies. Others are still under development, such as disaster prevention, technology, and power of our power distribution networks. And uh, I will not introduce the about well-known technologies here. Uh, I will tell something different. So it's about my research. Uh, I will introduce you to the distribution cross-domain fusion model of the uh, most model data fusion method. As you can see, in the future distribution networks, we built a large number of new energy subjects. These energy subjects, including distributed and renewable and generations, even in the customer domain, uh, as well as the traditional distribution networks in the distribution domain. And together, it formed our future distribution networks. In the tape of the cross-domain distribution network, the number of data acquisition terminal and data volume continues to grow. The data types are getting wild. Therefore, it's necessary to process a cost corresponding data process method. Uh, in that way, we have followed King technologies to solve the first multi-structured integration. Distribution networks, uh, multimodal data is uh, uh, with multiple structures, it's including structured time zero data, unstructured imaging video and text te text data from different field and business. How to effectively integrate multiple structured data with different form is a key technology issue to be studied. Then there is the problem of multiple time scale fusion. Because different sensing terminal of data acquisition systems have different sampling uh, frequency, the model data data generated by them have multiple time scale and cannot be directly fused. So we can see from the table, we found we have the data type from the uh, warm scada and visual imaging imaging. So we have different frequencies for, for the every uh, sensing. And uh, the next problem is there are also no possible attribute problem. In future distribution networks, the power grid is coupled with the various energy source such as heat and the gas networks. It's also coupled with the traffic networks with dramatic and the information networks with control functions. So the nodes in the future distribution networks belong to energy networks, transportation networks, and information networks at the same time. Uh, and to solve the about these problems, we propose the following technology frameworks. Uh, considering the multiple attributing attributes of the node, multiple attribute modeling is perform use uh, attribute size equations describe describe uh, perform association a relationship modeling by using the, by uh, by using energy hubs a social node technology modeling one or more method of the uh, mathematical modeling topical uh, topological structure modeling and the data driven I adopt for the field analysis. Here, I will use a very topical and common example to introduce the significance of the conducting the research on the cross-dominal data fusion model and the most data data fusion method of the distributions. So I believe there are many of us use the experience to installing ele electricity vehicle charging and chargers. Nowadays, in the China, we need to report, approve, and verify the capacity at the power bureau before you installing and using the charger. In the future, the installing and use the EV chargers to be as easy as charger cell phone. 
you just need to plug and play on the user side and demand side and in the future distribution networks. To achieve these goals, we need to improve the cooler and fault tolerance of the distribution equipment, security analysis through the intro networks integration in the power networks of future distribution networks, control and uh, automate the operation of different uh, networks between the power networks and the transportation networks, even information networks. So, uh, therefore, uh, some our thoughts and outlooks on the future distribution networks. I'm glad to be here to communicate with you. And uh, thanks, Sigri, again, and uh, providing this uh, platform. Uh, thank you, everyone. So, that's all. Thank you very much, Dr. Ma. Really interesting um, presentation, I guess, dealing with the multifaceted problems and, and multi domain data sets. Um, yeah, really looking forward to the opportunity to ask some more questions in the panel session. Uh, so from there, we will uh, fly right on through uh, to our third presenter. Tara, are you um, online and all set up? Hi, Matt. Yep, here I am. Fantastic. So um, our, our third presenter is Taru Violainen. Taru is a senior analyst in the Future Energy Systems team at the Australian Energy Market Operator, uh, com more commonly known as AEMO. She currently works on the integration of distributed energy resources for operational needs. Um, and Taru's knowledge on DER behaviours and implications has been developed through roles in Standards Australia committees for small scale inverters uh, and through analysis of power system events for AEMO since 2018. Uh, she holds a degree in renewable energy engineering from the University of New South Wales. So uh, once again, Taru, I think you'll bring a, a different perspective. Really looking forward uh, to hearing. I will just make you the presenter and the floor will be yours. So hopefully now you should uh, should be able to screen share and far away. Sorry, just making sure it's the right screen. Okay. Yeah, no stress. Hopefully you can see that in full presentation mode. Uh, yeah, that's in full presentation and the audio quality is great. Excellent. I'll drop <laughs> into the background. Wonderful. Thanks. Um, thanks so much for letting me present today and hopefully um, it's just good to be able to share some of the work that um, AMO has been doing. Um, but it's also really kind of complementary to some of the presentation that Peter um, had raised as well. Um, so as Matt mentioned, I am from the Australian Energy Market Operator and we are the independent energy operator um, for two markets, so both the NEM um, which covers the east coast of Australia um, and the WEM, which covers um, sort of the main load centre on the west coast, so around Perth. Um, and sort of our role is really um, to operate the wholesale electricity market um, and also the power grid. So we sort of do that at the transmission level, but we do have a lot of elements as we have this growing penetration of DER. So we are sort of, um, not um, sort of having to become involved in the distribution network as well. Um, so as I, like as I sort of mentioned and alluded to, is we are um, experienced. I mean, we have huge amounts of distributed photovoltaics, um, and we are actually experiencing the largest penetration of distributed photovoltaics in the world in the NEM. Um, by distributed PV, we are really referring to those, to actually the ones on your households and commercial businesses. We're actually talking really small scale devices that act passively and just contribute to the power system um, where we have a lot less control and a lot less um, visibility of those systems. We, um, this is sort of a, a trend that we've seen across um, sort of Australia really. We're sort of seeing it through all our different regions and one of the ones I really want to highlight is um, South Australia but I know um, Peter did show a lot of the sort of the contribution as well that Queensland has but um, in South Australia for example we've actually seen times um, where over 90% of our underlying demand um, is actually met by distributed PV. So it's a really huge contributor um, to our generation mix. Looking a little bit more into South Australia, um, what we've actually found is that 
um, we at the moment there, there, there is actually over um, two gigawatts of distributed PV in the region and um, it's growing very rapidly. So we're actually seeing about 20 megawatts per month. Um, as I mentioned, we've seen times where it's supplying up to 92%. And so the way we um, and what AMO really has to do is our job is about monitoring that supply and demand. And so whilst historically we would have um, managed our managed generation to this top um, sort of line, as we're seeing all this distributed PV and solar coming online, it actually means that now the way that we have to manage the power system changes significantly and we're actually having to manage um, for the dips and the load um, down to this sort of bottom line. And so it just shows how significant um, this contribution of PV is and how um, and how big an impact. And so here we can even see that um, we've seen a record to date where it's gone down to 104 megawatts when we usually see demand sort of above um, 1.2 gigawatts at times. So, so quite a quite a big um, cont contributor. So given, given that, um, we have seen quite a number of challenges that it's sort of creating on our network. Um, I have sort of limited this presentation just down to three, but there are quite a number of other areas. So looking specifically at the um, at sort of the behaviour of these distributed PV systems and how they have ha have impacted sort of um, the way we operate the power system, um, we also see that um, as it's kind of creating this huge. Um, diminishing our sort of our actual load that we operate in, what that actually, what impact that has to operating the power system and um, providing for essential services. Um, and then also how we manage situations or how it's impacting our under frequency load shedding um, service. Um, so all of these are sort of, you know, different, they are slightly different, but they're also very interrelated with one another and they each sort of impact as well. So each of those um, do require a slightly different approach and I will sort of talk through a couple of the solutions, but not in too much detail. So the first challenge um, that I mentioned was about distributed PV disconnection. Um, so in this case, I just sort of thought it might be really helpful just to explain a little bit about sort of AEMO's role and, and sort of one of our core functions, which we, um, which we do. So our role is really about balancing supply and demand continuously uh, and instantaneously. And this is, off, this is measured through frequency, which you sort of see here. We do have a buffer, which we sort of, um, you know, can manage the, um, the supply and demand and we have to manage that seesaw. But um, if it does go beyond outside of those buffers, you know, we, there is potential to have damage to equipment or appliances. Uh, so we do incorporate a number of mechanisms to try to maintain that, such as that under frequency load shedding, which I'll talk about later. Um, one of the other things that we do, and if, if we can't really manage it within this buffer zone and it is really problematic, we do, um, we do, we could end up in a full blackout um, and, and we could have quite a severe event that happens if our supply and demand balance isn't, isn't well balanced. So the way that PV is impacting our work is that we're actually seeing so much PV come on that it actually means that we have to now think about it as a supply um, side because it's actually a generator. It actually is something that we have to think about on this right hand side, even though we even though it actually comes from the demand side. As we get more and more um, rooftop PV being installed, we now have to um, consider a larger amount of solar um, on the supply side. And what we actually do as well is we have to curtail all of the other generation um, at, the, at that time. So we're not all, but we do have to curtail some generation that's operating at that time. What we've found though is we have identified that sometimes the behaviour of solar is actually not helpful um, in some situations. So once again, we have this supply demand balance, our solar is on um, the right side, and then we might have an incident. So for example, we might see a fire at a generating station like a coal plant, which we can't necessarily predict. And then suddenly we see a trip um, our, of that system. So the demand um, balance is out. And then what we've been seeing um, is that we've actually been seeing that solar in 
as a, as a consequence of that trip, it actually, um, its response is to also disconnect, which means that now we are putting ourselves in times where our supply demand balance is even worse and even further out of whack, rather than at least being in a position where we are able to correct for it. Um, so if we can, at the moment where it's it's okay, and if we don't do anything, at, but if we don't do anything at all, and as solar continues to grow and this box gets bigger and bigger and becomes a bigger sort of balance on our, um, bigger weight on our balance, then eventually, um, you know, we might have, we have a, a number of um, concerns and challenges with that. And that could, yeah, once again, lead to sort of cascading blackouts as an absolute um, worst case scenario. So um, just a bit of more background, we actually have seen that um, that event where we, we do see a lot of um, distributed PV disconnecting in a region. So we have seen, once again, this is in South Australia, we've seen um, following a, dis a system disturbance, we have seen up to 40% of distributed PV in a region disconnect. Um, and so you can actually see that as we go out from the event, the location of the event, it does, you know, it does reduce, but we do see quite large amounts of um, distributed PV disconnect um, close, close to the event. Uh, so this means that we might have really large contingency sizes. So when we have an event, we have to not only worry about the size of the loss of a potential generator, we also have to think about the loss of the PV additional to that generator. And so that would mean that we have to have to do a lot to manage that. So some of the solutions for um, correcting for this issue. Um, so the big one is a, that we've um, already sort of worked on is about improving our distributed energy resource ride through standards. Um, so that means that if we can actually program into the inverters to make sure that they, um, if they were to see this event, instead of disconnecting, they actually remain riding, riding through, um, then that would actually help reduce that, that that risk. So we're calling it sort of stop the rot because it would effectively um, minimise how much of that of those PV um, disconnects in consequence. Um, and so we've worked very extensively with this on this, and um, Peter was part of the committee as well. Um, and this standard became mandatory um, in December, um, or it was published in December 2020, and then became mandatory a year later, allowing um, the manufacturers and everybody to. Um, uplift their requirements. Um, I've got this point here on compliance, and I'll get into that in the next slide, but we, there is sort of a question about the ability to manage that compliance to those standards. Um, in the meantime, what we also do is to we do need to manage all those legacy systems. We've, we've had a lot of PV um, incorporated into the system. So the way we do that is we do already um, have develop some network constraints for some regions. So we actually change how the network operates and make sure that it's within stability limits. We account for those larger contingency sizes. So we actually um, take more reserve and make sure that there's more um, generators that might um, help out if that situation were to occur. Um, and we also um, have changed a couple of our operating procedures. So just making sure that we maintain contingency sizes within limits. Um, and we remove you know line outages if those are happening on those particular days um, and we're you know working with um, some with many networks to look at options where we can curtail distributed PV as a as a last resort on those um, events all of these sort of three key areas down below they have all you know had to go into our power system models um, where we've had to you know effectively represent the um, behavior of the power system in those um, systems so it's actually been a huge body of work to really um, to really look into that as I mentioned sort of the compliance with technical standards so even though this um, was brought forward and it became mandatory from December 2021. We have um, been looking at the actual, how that has actually rolled out. Like I sort of mentioned, these are individual household devices. Um, so it's actually quite a big um, challenge for us. So we've actually identified that about 40% of those systems installed since the 
um, since the standard was introduced have actually not necessarily been um, to the correct 4777 standard um, and they're actually being set to the older standard which in most cases um, means that they actually won't have some of those ride through capabilities and that's been a bit of a concern. Um, and so there are some OEMs, I do want to note that some OEMs have informed us that they will still have the ride through capabilities, even if set to the wrong standard. Um, but that's not the majority, unfortunately. So we have been working um, on a couple of solutions in this area. We're looking at working with distribution um, businesses to help um, help um, work on this as well as work, working with manufacturers um, to help correct some of the systems on, um, that are already installed and also working um, at options to improve the standard so that we can remove some of this, this 2015 standard from selection. And then there's also some regulatory things that we're working through around sort of the governance frameworks. Um, so the next challenge, and I'm sort of conscious about time, is with looking at sort of essential power system services. As I mentioned, our load is declining um, quite significantly. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to make sure that we have large generators that provide a lot of other services to us. So a big um, coal plant actually provides us a lot of system strength, um, provides us inertia capability, as well as frequency control and voltage control. Um, and those large plants, they actually have a minimum um, level that they need to operate in um, to be able to um, to be able to be online. If they can't operate at a certain level, they actually have to be disconnected completely. And so we are finding that we that we're almost going to get to times where those um, levels into that those levels cross, and we actually might need to do some actions where we need to um, stop having PV providing generation to us um, and actually um, making sure that we can maintain those um, minimum levels so that the other generators um, are online at those times when we need it. So um, we're sort of anticipating that that could happen um, in sort of in some regions in the next few years and so um, and some of these thresholds might be reached earlier if we have some regions in island conditions or um, bushfires um, or other situations. So some of the solutions um, around that are also this um, idea of having an emergency PV backstop curtailment capability. So actually being able to turn off the PV system. So actually um, there would be, each system could be um, controlled by a party um, to be able to, to disconnect. We're also exploring other ways of providing minimum essential system services in those, demand, in those minimum demand periods. Can we get them from other types of generators um, or, you know, what other devices and network devices do we need? And can we look at options like two-sided um, markets to help sort of slowly prevent um, these situations even arising uh, so that there's the, um, so that distributed PV becomes part of the wholesale market and they um, aren't necessarily, they're actually not incentivized to be operating at those times. Um, the third and final challenge is our under frequency load shedding. So I sort of mentioned this before, um, but it's effectively our safety net designed to arrest severe under frequency events. So if our frequency is really low, we, um, we are able to do a controlled disconnection of load uh, in less than a second to rebalance a large supply demand imbalance. Uh, so this is a, sort of an example of what that would look like. Um, we have our all these loads acting as a load. Um, and then when we see the frequency go out of um, go out of the range, then what happens is we actually can open a switch and we disconnect all of those loads so they're um, no longer um, so then we can correct our load and um, demand balance once again. What we're finding though is as we're getting more distributed PV um, that when that at times even though um, it's it's might be acting and we've got the um, capability there, even when it um, goes out of bounds, it actually, um, we open the load, but it's actually not doing anything because um, because um, DER isn't actually helping in those situations. And then we're actually seeing that if that could get um, progressively worse as we have more feeders um, in reverse flows, so where um, the PV is actually um, sending power the opposite way. And so if we have another event, our, um, our frequency is out of balance. And then what we actually find is when we open this switch that we're actually 
disconnecting more um, generation and it's actually making the situation much worse. So options we can do is to actually disarm those um, relays when it detects reverse flows. So if it actually sees it going the opposite way, then we actually just don't disconnect this, um, we don't switch this site, this load off and it actually continues to operate. So yeah, sort of, um, as I mentioned, we've sort of seen reducing net load, um, which reduces the effectiveness of those UFLS capability. Um, those reverse flows cause UFLS to operate in reverse, exacerbating a frequency decline and distributed PV disconnection exacerbates that. So some of the solutions um, that we could consider are adding additional flow uh, loads where available. So um, to a single feeder, actually making that, spreading that out over a wider area um, that might have those capabilities, but as we sort of see, and we're seeing this huge increase of DPV, those um, we, we will eventually hit limits. Um, as I mentioned, we have that dynamic arming option um, to disable UFLS flows. One that um, Peter had mentioned is about this dynamic operating envelopes um, and having limits on how much can reverse flows we, we can have um, around the network. We have options as well looking at network constraints, but this can be um, is limited and can be a bit larger. And then there's also, once again, looking at alternate equivalent services. Can we look at um, large scale batteries or something to be able to provide some of those UFLS capability, but it would depend on um, sort of what they're operating at the time of those events. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, this is sort of a huge body of work. Um, these were only three of quite a few challenges that we're facing. Um, and we are you know, trying to be able to allow as much DER as possible. And we do want to remove as much um, or as many barriers as we can. Um, and so yeah, just been working through that. So if you are um, interested in more information, we do have um, all of this information um, on this page on our website in the DER operations space. But yeah, that's for me. Apologies, I went a bit over time. Uh, you did very, very well, Tara. It covered a lot of information in a very short period. And it's uh, really interesting to see that um, bigger picture market view um, and how some of these changes are, you know, well, they're, as you say, at a rooftop small generation scale, the impact they're having, um, yeah, particularly within, you know, Australia. And interesting to see that comparison with China, which, um, I will now segue to our, our final presenter before the panel session. So, uh, Dr. Rong Yi, uh, Rong, are you able to come off mute? And fantastic. Oh, okay, can um, you see me? And can you hear me? Yep, now? can see you. Hear, see you, and audio is great. Um, oh. So, I'll, by way of of um, well, not even last introduction because we've also got Dr. Yingji Tan joining us for the the panel session. But Dr. Rong is the Deputy Director of Staccom Production at TBEA and is responsible for the planning and development of products related to the Staccom product line. His uh, responsibilities include marketing, product delivery, customer service, quality management, and other product lifecycle management duties. Uh, during his doctoral studies, Rong studied flexible AC-DC transmission technology, transformer and reactive load switching control technology, and participated in a number of grid level science and technology development projects as a core delivery member. So um, definitely looking forward to a, a bit of a different perspective, um, looking at flexible AC transmission services and, and what you've got to present. I'll hand over uh, the presentation role. You should be a presenter now, uh, Rong, and you should be able to share your screen once again. I'll drop off in the background and looking forward to hearing more. Okay. Can you he uh, hear me and see my screen now? Yeah, audio and screen are both great. Okay. Uh, there may be some delay, uh, so I'll go slower. Uh, thank you for the invitation from the secret. Uh, and uh, I, my name is Hong Yi, and I'm from TBA Sun Oasis uh, company. Today, uh, we are talking about the power supply and distribution solutions for data center with power electronics 
uh, which we also call it PET. Uh, first, let's talk about us. Uh, TBEA is a system solution provider for global energy industry with three listed companies, uh, which it mainly has formed an industry industrial cluster based on energy, power transmission and transformation, high-end manufacture, and new energies and new materials. Uh, in the traditional transformer, uh, China has made uh, a lot of efforts and you can see uh, in nowadays, uh, our uh, biggest uh, transformer has been manufactured at the world first uh, uh, 1,100 uh, KV converter transformer has been developed. Uh, today we are talking about the data center solutions and let's make a total introduction of data center. 5G, cloud comp computing, internet of things, AI and other digital technology and industry promotes the leapfrog development of data center to meet the needs of faster and wider application of the digital economy, uh, which here, uh, data centers are incorporated in new infrastructure. Data center power supply and distribution system capacity, which is 20, uh, nearly 24 gigawatts in 2020 and will reach uh, 50 to uh, 50 gigawatts in 2030 in China. The traditional power supply solution for data center, which UPS, HVDC, and Panama distribution system. Uh, the disadvantages of these solutions are low, uh, like low efficiency, large current ripples, and uh, uh, you can see. Uh, in every uh, solutions, there is a tr tr uh, traditional transformers here, uh, and, and it's very big and <clears throat> always make a lot of power loss when it has been operated. Uh, to solve this problem, uh, uh, TBE has made a power supply solution for data center. As you can see, we uh, make a multi-port SST, which is solid state transformer. Uh, and it consists of uh, electronics parts and take place of uh, most of the parts of the traditional solutions. The power supply scheme of TBA data center improves efficiencies, reduces footprint and reduce operations and maintenance of the difficulty. Uh, as you can see, data center is an industry uh, where the proportion of energy consumption to the total electricity consumption of society continu continues to grow. Therefore, the active development of, hey, uh, sorry. Can you hear me and see the screen now? It mentioned my internet yep. fault. Okay, okay. Still, Let's go still got the screen on development background of Green oh, Health oh. Center. Okay, let's move on. Therefore, the active development of green data center is a great significance of China to achieve the goal of carbon peaking and carbon neutrality. This is the uh, typical solutions of TBEA green data center campus power. Uh, it has some advantages. Full working condition, condition energy saving, and multi ports Fusion. You can see it's here, uh, ports. It has a lot of ports to the different uh, buses. Highly reliable power supplies, low carbonization operations and intelligent operations and maintenance. Uh, uh, and then we are talking about the edge uh, decentralized data center. With the outbreak of 5G, emerging industries such as man driving and smart home will generate huge amounts of data, accelerating the increase of marginal data center. 
uh, this is our product. Uh, it has some uh, advantages. It integrated, integrated transformers, uh, traditional transformers, uh, and solid state transformers, hybrid dual power supply, AC DC hybrid power supply, diesel and energy store dual backup power. Uh, it ha also has the function with APF, SVG, and active grounds, uh, power supply quality, intelligent operation and maintenance. Uh, this is the structure of uh, 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 all of the structure has been put into this container, and you can see it's a uh, lot of things here. It creates solutions designed of traditional transformer, solid state transformer, uh, ring network cabinets and backup batteries. Uh, in the applications, the uh, uh, there are some details that design, such as two circuits power supply, module redundant, re redundance, fast smooth switching and do uh, uh, Axler power supply. The detailed designs of each link ensures high reliability of power supply for data center. Uh, you can see a traditional transformer is put here, and our SST has been put here. Uh, we, uh, uh, with this uh, design, the reliability of this system can be improved. Uh, High integrate design for 12 meters containers, uh, which has been shown before. Uh, through full consideration of circuit topology, product design and field uh, installation. Uh, it is very easy to installation in the field. Uh, most of the, uh, the most of this stuff has been manufactured in our uh, uh, factory and. It is very easy to install in the field. Uh, let's see the fifth part, the products and case for data center. 60% of operating cost of data center is electricity, and it will become the mainstream tent of data center power su supply developments to achieve significant improvements in power supply system efficiency, space utilization and green power utilization by reducing transformations and distribution links, shorten distribution link and reduce the number of power conventional stage. Uh, as you can see, our products have uh, the power from uh, fifth uh, 500 ki kilowatts to 2.5 megawatts. The demonstration sites of ANWA data center adopts the power distribution two-stage AC DC hybrid system. You can see it here and here. Uh, structures based on solid state transformer cluster. The project has the technical characteristic for four voltage levels, you can see the 10 kV is here, uh, uh, alternative current, 10 kV is DC, uh, directive current, uh, and 380 uh, AC, and 375 DC. Three-stage loop network, two-stage power distribution and cluster operation. It aims to realize the efficiency consumption of renewable energy, realize the efficiency and reliable power supply of data center, and significant improve the overall system efficiency and flexible network ability. The product uh, uh, is put uh, outside, and you can see the in the uh, in the data center. It's like this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yi. Um, appreciate the presentation and some really um, application-specific um, information there. Um, with that, 
we trans, um, now transition into the um, into the, the panel session of the discussion. But before we do that, um, Bo, I just check that you're still online and, and ready to facilitate. And before we do jump in on, I might just quickly introduce Ying Ji, who's joining us for the panel session. Are you online? Hey, Fantastic. Hey, Matthew, thank Thanks you. very much. Yeah, loud and clear. So, um, look at this stage. I would just ask anyone who has any questions from our four presenters um, to start posting them in the questions panel. Otherwise, uh, you should have the option to raise your hand when the question when we start the question session. If you did want to raise your hand, um, we can look at um, coming off mute and asking questions directly. But um, slight preference towards using the questions panel. Um, so uh, I'll quickly introduce uh, Dr. Yingji Tan Bo and then hand that over to you. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Yingji received his doctoral degree from the University of Wollongong in Australia, so has a, uh, a local Australian connection. Um, since receiving his doctorate, he's worked as a research scientist and a senior engineer in the Electric Power Research Institute of China Southern Power Grid. Uh, he's a member of the IEC Technical Committee 8 and uh, Study Committee 8B, an IEEE member, a committee member of China National Standardization Technical Committee for Microgrids uh, and Integration of Distributed Generation. Uh, and his research interests include microgrids, distributed renewable power generation, uh, the distribution network uh, and other applications. Um, his work in that space has included um, research on microgrids, distribution network planning, um, and also contributing to several international uh, and national standards, as well as publications in highly recognized academic journals. Currently, Ying Ji's work is focusing on the challenges and opportunities brought about by the energy transition and the prevalence of uh, high penetration distributed generation. Uh, and is particularly exploring possible uh, the possible architecture uh, of the future distribution network um, in his current focus. So, uh, Ying Ji, welcome. Uh, I guess at this point we'll start to open the floor uh, to all questions. And Bo, I'll hand it over to you. Um, if you had anything to add, uh, looks like we're starting to get a few questions flowing through. Okay, okay, thank you, Matthew. And thank you for all the speakers. That's very uh, good process that we have for this webinar. We shared a lot of, certainly share a lot of uh, knowledge and information about uh, the trial to achieve future distribution network uh, from both sides of the country. And uh, we can do this uh, question part into two parts. Uh, because I think everyone may still need a bit time to come up with questions. Uh, we do have some of the ad already at the question parts, but we do have some preset questions. I will ask a few preset questions first to our speakers and hope you could uh, warm up and start the Q and A. Uh, so uh, the question that uh, the, the first preset question that we have uh, will be addressed to. Uh, utilities uh, probably from both of the countries. Uh, as you have already mentioned that we are facing a challenge uh, between the two of the countries to achieve a high penetration uh, of renewable energies and also to the uh, safe operation of uh, grid system at different voltage level. And uh, you have already given us some of the uh, suggestions. But to further uh, summary this kind of uh, uh, tech challenges and the technical solution. Uh, is there any ultimate uh, solution that we've been looking for uh, from your country? Uh, I will. I will first give this question to uh, Dr. Tai Injie because he hasn't speak yet. So, uh, Dr. Tan, can you uh, give us some of your opinions? Yes, I'm. I'm gonna have to uh, kick out some ideas. Actually, I, I'm too. I have this uh, question for Peter and the Chai as well. So, so from my point of view, <laughs> so actually uh, at this uh, stage, actually the um, distributed generation in the penetration level in China, especially in the China Southern Park grid is 
a lot that high as as high as the uh, Australian power grid at, at this at this stage. So actually, so where the problems uh, you are encountering at this stage actually we are maybe our future, but uh, the problem is not that uh, serious for us at this stage. But but we do uh, think that so that that is um, definitely is the future for us. So uh, what but. As, as Peter and Jaru mentioned in, in the in the presentations, and you have proposed some solutions to for the, to address the issues caused by the uh, distributed uh, photovoltaic and uh, the distribution network, and but from my point of view, and for example, the the solution like you are uh, um, proposing the. A uh, new body uh, standard from um, 240 to 230 years. I, I I think it it can leave some space for more pe penetration of uh, photovoltaic, and so the penetration level. But uh, so this is from the, the point the body point of view. But and the the active powers is still a problem. I think so. For example, for the um, the reverse power, power flow to, to the distribution transformers. So. Uh, and so, from my point of view, this is not the ultimate <laughs> uh, solution for the for the pro, for the problem caused by the uh, high penetration of uh, distributed PV. So, uh, so what we are exploring at this stage is actually try to, I think, uh, a more uh, let me say uh, crazily <laughs> to upgrade the. Uh, architecture of the distribution distribution network. So, for example, as um, what actually what we are thinking about is the the we, we call it the uh, we use the the idea of uh, the balance in the in, in a different level. So, balance the the demand and the generation from different levels. For example, from the uh, dis distribution and transformer level. So, we can we can say is the is kind of microgrid. So, the try to balance the demand and the uh, node from this uh, level, uh, and then if it can, if the if the microgrid cannot handle the uh, the balance between the generation and demand, and then okay, then just go a bit uh, up level to the like the medium voltage level, and then we try to uh, share the actual power or reactive power in different zones. So we we call it different zones means different um, microgrids or different. Uh, uh, zones uh, relevant to the um, yeah, distribution and transformer and zones. And so try, try to share the active power and the reactive power in different zones. And then we try to uh, keep the balance and share uh, to, to reduce the, uh, re the, the active power, uh, reverse power flow to the upper level. We try to keep it to the minimum. So in order to achieve this, we t um, so what we are thinking is to try to um, apply some power electronics uh, technologies to like we we can so we can have a more f a flexible uh, configuration, preferred configuration of the uh, distribution network. And so, for example, we can have some flexible connections between different feeders and a diff from from different. Uh, at, at, we just say. Uh, the different balancing zones, so the the lowest level, like this. So, so this this is the well, just that's why I am saying it's, it's kind of a crazy thinking at this stage. Okay, okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. I think you should already have your presentation prepared to better answer this question. <laughs> I also like to give this question to Peter. Peter, would you please just share some of your opinions on this one? Uh, have you already find a say ultimate solution, ultimate vision of this uh, future uh, network? Uh, yeah, I hesitate to suggest any any solution is the ultimate. Um, I think engineering is always a compromise between all the different requirements we have to consider. But I, I certainly would like to build on Dr. Tan's um, suggestion. I think I think increasing flexibility in the electricity system is very important and I think there's huge opportunities for that with the electrification of transport, the growth in electric vehicles, the electrification of heating and cooling, um, the, these um, significantly growing uh, demands on the electricity network also have um, capability to be, to be very flexible 
and so that the charging can be maximised when when there is excess generation and and ran back during those peaks. So I think I think that flexibility um, is a huge huge opportunity, and I encourage uh, Dr. Tan's craziness. I think I think we need a bit of craziness in this transformation of the power system. I've heard someone put it like uh, rebuilding an aeroplane while it's flying. Um, Aru has to keep the system up 24/7, and um, we've got to do that while we completely. Uh, change the system from a one-way to a two-way power grid. Um. Okay, thank you, thank you, Or. And actually, we also have some. Sorry, sorry, Bo. <laughs> so actually, I have a, a I have a question for Peter. So, so because you mentioned that you have the um, like the 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 body and the standard from the two forty to two thirty, but this is for like the so over voltage situation then so in some situations like the because the, we know that the, we only have the sunshine in the daytime but so, so nothing at night so it means so yeah we may have this um, solution to uh, to conquer the over voltage problem but it can the low voltage problems so under voltage so, so problem can occur in at night then how to balance this uh, the uh, competition we can say Absolutely. I think it requires more flexibility, more dynamic control. So those voltage systems that we've used in the past have to be able to push the voltage um, around more. And ideally, if you've got monitoring and visibility, as um, Dr. Ingrid Ma mentioned, at the, at, at, across the distribution network and better visibility of where you're approaching those limits, um, that allows you to um, manage the control of your voltage better so that it's not too high in the middle of the day when everyone's generating PV and it's also not too low in, in the evening and overnight. Um, okay, that's good. Uh, also, we have already have uh, three questions already in the uh, question chart. Uh, the first question is for Peter and Taru. Uh, it's from Elvin and she's asking, uh, uh, could you please explain a bit more about the rule of the organizations and how it fits with the wider system? Of course, you can look uh, onto uh, the company network, uh, but can you to give a, a further brief introduction of the, your company and the relative uh, industrial insiders? Thank you. Carrie, why don't you start your call? Yeah, that lady go first. So, so you're just sort of wanting to understand a little bit more about how how AEMO fits in with sort of different organisations. Is that sort of? Yeah. But the the question, okay. Taru, was getting towards um, market structure, like how how what industry structure probably. Where does where does AEMO and the network fit, and what's the structure around that? How many utilities are there? How do they work together? Um, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so AMO sort of sits um, um, above sort of the, we have obviously then the transmission system. Um, so we sort of sit sort of above that um, because we're, our, our job is effectively about sort of dispatching generation and um, to, to meet the load at all times. And so we, operate that market that would then dispatch that generation accordingly um, based on some forecasts of load that we would have and we would do that regionally across the different transmission systems and in the sort of map of Australia that I had yeah we do have the um, five regions that we we operate in and then within um, those regions they have their transmission system but uh, which are all interconnected with one another but um, are operating themselves and then underneath that there would be um, multiple distribution businesses um, with Energy Queensland being one um, and but then there's about 14 distributors um, across Australia that we would sort of work with um, if that makes sense. I'm not sure Peter want to add something. Yeah so it's, it's, it's a very disaggregated system um, there's not one vertically integrated utility that manages the generation the transmission and, and the distribution. And um, beyond the distribution, there's also a retail market. So um, the retailers either own generation assets or um, purchase um, energy from independent generators. And then 
pay for the, the transmission and, and operation and distribution services and bundle that all up to sell to customers um, who consume electricity at the end. Um, so it's, it's, it's designed to be as competitive as possible and heavily regulate any monopolies such as the networks that remain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. That's very clear. Hope that I have already answered your question, Lee. Uh, and then we have a second question coming from Robin, and this one is also for Teru. Uh, given the power imbalance and the rate of change of frequency that you mentioned will go together with Initia, is AMO uh, considering the rate of uh, control for frequency injection control curtailment at device level as a mean of control? Uh, Teru, can you answer that? Um, so at the at a household device and at the DER level, um, probably not. Uh, we wouldn't be considering um, using that as a form of injection just because there there's a lot of complex factors going on. Um, sort of at a at a larger system level, I'm actually not too sure. Um, I'd say we we're at the, like obviously the, the impact is to try to withstand it and we have a lot more um, increasing inverter-based resources that will have greater capability in doing that um, but yeah a lot of it is really about you know making sure that we have those inertia sources and um, other and looking at sort of other plant that might be able to provide those sort of system services so like um, looking at yeah whether whether those inverter-based resources can provide that um, as well but I'm yeah well, so I'm, I'm quite um, only sort of restricted in my knowledge um, uh, across all then compared to the whole, whole business. But yeah. I would maybe just add very, very quickly on that, Bo. There is, I mean, there is markets that are being set up around providing that rate of change of frequency style support, so um, frequency and ancillary services or FCAS. So that, that's really putting a, a value to an ability to provide a response based on, I guess, absolute frequency, but there's a rate of change um, or, or a fast pace change built into that. So, sorry, back to you, Beck. Okay, thank you for uh, uh, backing up with this information. And there also, for this information, I think uh, it has to uh, bring out some of the issues with the equipment. And unlike uh, Peter mentioned in his uh, presentation, there will be uh, a lot of, uh, the place or say a lot of uh, supporting that could be provided by the inverter is more like reforming each uh, capability or something like that. But I'd like to give this question to uh, Dr. Rong Yi. Uh, Dr. Rong, you are, you've been uh, in the field of uh, power electronic devices development for long. Uh, what's your opinion of uh, future function of the inverters or PV or some, uh, PE uh, in the future uh, distribution system. Dr. Rong Yi. Uh, okay, I can hear. Thank you, uh, Dr. Leibo. Uh, my opinion for the distribution system is uh, uh, the power, uh, like what I have been reported, the power, electro power electronic transformer uh, and the solid state transformer. Uh, in the future, the DC current in the distribution system will be uh, more and more, uh, and the traditional distribution network will be uh, take place by the DC. Uh, uh, And so and, and that is the direction of our company's future. <laughs> okay, okay. Probably this is still uh, under development. And uh, Peter, you want to have uh, have something? I, I certainly think the capabilities of power electronics are going to be very important as we see. Um, the, the, I guess the volatility and the variability on the system increase and um, their, their capacity, like you mentioned, from, from grid forming inverters from Staccom uh, to respond in extremely rapidly is, is an essential capability in the future power system. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, as, and, and also, I just uh, mentioned that in order to have the 
a flexible interconnection of the like the uh, distribution feeders. Actually, Pyrotronics will play a very important role in, in order to have the, the interconnections between such uh, distribution feeders. And it's, and Dr. Yong just mentioned is uh, they call it the solid state transformers. Actually, we have the different names for such devices as well. We have like the soft switchers means <laughs> for the, the interconnections as well. So I think this is very important just from my point of view as well. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, I think probably we'll have time for two more questions. Uh, I think we have one more question, one question for uh, Dr. Mar. Uh, Dr. Mar, you mentioned uh, a lot of the uh, algorithm and also the modeling uh, of the distribution system in your presentation. And, uh, and some of the system are, say, comprehensive energy system, which contains, say, uh like gas like the other kind of form of energies so what do you think is the uh most important thing to uh achieve say uh safe operation and also uh over over uh, overall uh, efficiency and economic benefits for a comprehensive energy system dr mark can you share your uh, kind of the views so in my opinion, there are uh, some um, most important things we need to consider. First one, mm -hmm. the supply side. When the supply side in China, we almost use, we have the uh, two uh, two carbon build. I don't know how to say it in English real. So, <laughs> but maybe Chinese all about know about the carbon because that's like in my our colleagues, we have a project we will uh, produce uh, zero carbon zero carbon colleagues. So the first one is the supply side. Supply side will use the most of the PV, the PV and the, that's like wind, uh, wind power. So and also in the in the Qinghai province we have a lot of hydro hydro power. So here and the second side in the uh, demand side, demand side because just like our colleagues, our colleagues have in the very cold place. So we have use the gas to add the thermal energy. So we need this value is it's why a lot of energy. So in this part, we we plan to use the electrical power to replace the gas power. So this is two part. First one is in the supply side, and second in the demand side. And in the operation, the operation is the most important things. We have the same things, but we need to provide the more efficient uh, products. So we. I think they the most of three important things in the uh, operation, the uh, multiple integrated system. So, and uh, okay. okay, so <laughs> well, it's a hard question. Thank you. Uh, uh, wait, one last question from the question chart is that uh, asked by, uh, and he's asking or she's asking, is there any plan of China? To implement an equal equivalent standard like uh, AS four seven 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 point two, just like uh, to mention in uh, Australia, to ensure the compliance. But I think uh, probably uh, we don't have because we don't see uh, the very much detail of this uh, standard. I think it was probably asking the gist of the of the standards. So I think Dr. Tan has some of these uh, experiences in the. Uh, operational, like the standard of the distribution system. So, uh, Dr. Tan, can you answer the last question that we have? Yes, yes, I'm happy to answer that. Okay, so, uh, I, 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 I do not do not know the particular so the details of that standard, but we do have uh, um, a national as well as the enterprise uh, and technical standards to uh, to make sure that the compliance of the like the PV inverters is connected with the grid. So, for example, they have the. Uh, so, so we, we have the. I, I, I think we just the video asking me the question last time about the the uh, voltage recognition and capability of the PV inverters to to connect connecting with the, um, uh, the grid. So we so we do have such uh, standards. So for example, for the so just uh, uh, take the voltage recognition as an example. So but by the way, we have the inverters around different voltage networks. So, for example, if it's just in the medium voltage network, we do have some requirements for the inverters to participate in the voltage regulation. For example, they should 
the, the dispatchers should have the can send the control uh, uh, the demands to the, the inverters to to manipulate manipulate their the voltage uh, uh, injection or uh, absorption of the uh, on reactive power. But for the low voltage level uh, inverters, they just have to make sure that they operate in the uh, in particular range of a power factor, like so for, for example, 0 0.98 leading to 0 0.98 lagging in this level. It's, so it's, uh, it's fine for the low voltage level inverters. Like, it's like that. Yes, we have the standard, the standard for the PV inverters particularly. Okay, thank you, Tan, and I hope uh, that has answered uh, the question. And uh, as we're approaching the, the end, uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone, especially our dear speakers, uh, that you have done a great presentation uh, to uh, all the audience. And uh, it is really a great uh, pleasure that NGN uh, Australia, NGN China, we have this uh, great opportunity to have you and all the audience here to share uh, the, uh, the what we picture and what we think of uh, the future distribution network. Uh, we are all uh, pushing our way to achieve, say, like net zero. And it seems that we are both on the way, uh, though due to the, even we do have a difference, say in time, say in location, that we experience the same question and we are uh, pursuing a real solution to make this uh, distribution network a better uh, distribution network. And also, uh, Engine Australia, Engine China will continue uh, to carry out this kind of activities. And uh, that we hope all the young professionals and also uh, industrial insiders could join us uh, to share and benefits from this uh, international uh, young power network. And uh, that will be all for the for my summary. And I'd like to thank you, everybody. Uh, maybe you would like to say, say a few things and wrap up the one. Yeah, yeah, very quickly. Thank you very much for facil facilitating the Q and A session there, Bo. And um, I guess as a wrap up, a big thank you to all of our presenters. Um, for our Chinese counterparts, thank you for doing this in a second language. Um, very, very well done. Um, I can only say I would have been much, much more uh, poorly facilitated if we had to do it in Mandarin or Cantonese. Um, but thank you all very, very much. Also to Peter and Taru for staying late in the day um, and the effort and time that you've all put in. Um, I hope the audiences, and I'm sure the audiences found this to be a really interesting discussion. I know myself, um, I was left with a few questions that I wanted to ask. So I do hope Bo and, and Meng Zhang, we can continue this collaboration. Um, and next time, maybe we'll leave more, more time for Q&A because there's some really good discussion. But thank you to everyone. Again, encourage you um, from your respective countries. I know we've got a lot of nations on the line. Um, a lot of countries have C-Grey uh, organisations and young member groups. I encourage you to get involved either in a Chinese or Australian group or in uh, your respective countries but um, final thank you to everyone I hope everyone has a good uh, Thursday and lead into the weekend <laughs>